Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Havana. It's nice to see you all. Uh, we are going to, uh, we're joined uh, today by uh, some American business leaders who have traveled here to Cuba, uh, both to take part in the Entrepreneurship Summit that you just saw the President address, uh, but also to speak to all of you about the significance of the President's policy changes for the kind of business that they're involved in every day. Uh, so standing uh, immediately to my right uh, is Brian Chesky, who's the president and founder of Airbnb. Uh, to his right is uh, Carlos Gutierrez. Uh, many of you may have covered him as the Commerce Secretary uh, under President George W. Bush. Uh, and to his right is uh, Dan Schulman, who is the CEO of PayPal. Uh, I'm going to invite each of them to offer brief remarks. Uh, and then what we'll do is if you have questions that you would like to direct to one of them, uh, I'll call on you. Uh, we'll give them a, uh, an opportunity to take your questions. Then we'll let them let them go. Uh, and then Ben and I will stick around for a little while and take uh, questions that you may have on other topics. OK? So with that, Brian, do you want to uh, sure. kick us off here? Sure. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Brian Chesky, uh, founder and CEO of Airbnb. Um, we are a platform, obviously, we have 2 million homes around the world. About one year ago, we launched in here in uh, Cuba, April 2nd, 2015. Since then, we now have 4,000 homes in Cuba, and we estimate somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of Americans who travel to Cuba are now staying with a host on Airbnb. So it's been, we think, a very, very big success for us. And now, with the uh, permission of the Treasury Department, we're going to allow guests from all over the world to be able to book on Airbnb. And I think this trip, for me, was um, a great thing to watch President Obama speak of international diplomacy. And I think what we represent is diplomacy from a person-to-person -person level. Um, one of our hosts said that, you know, they had a lot of misconceptions about Americans, but when they live with you for a year, you start to think very, very differently about Americans. And so I think that what, we've off what, what, what we're a part of here is something that's been going on for a generation here in Cuba, but we're very, very, uh, very, very excited to be a part of this. Cuba is our fastest growing, we're in 191 countries, Cuba is the fastest growing country on Airbnb ever in the history of our platform. And I think hopefully this is just the very beginning of our development and also the beginning of many more friendships between our platform from Cubans with Americans and people all over the world. Thank you, Brian. Dan, you want to go next? Sure. Thanks, Josh. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's an honor uh, to be here uh, this evening with all of you on this historic day. Uh, and we are looking forward to working with the administration and the Cuban government to advance the uh, commercial ties and the uh, diplomatic ties between our countries. We have a mission at PayPal, it's very simple. It's to democratize financial services. And what we mean by that is that managing and moving money should be a right for all citizens, not just a privilege for the affluent. And there's a saying in the United States that it's expensive to be poor. Uh, and that's true in financial services. Many of the events that you and I take for granted, like cashing a check or paying a bill, getting a loan, or sending money to a loved one overseas, is very time consuming. You can wait in line for half an hour, an hour, two hours, just to make that transaction, and can also be very expensive. The typical global remittance costs anywhere between 10 and 15 percent. For Cuban Americans to send a remittance to Cuba can be anywhere between 15, 20, even 25 percent. And that's ridiculous with technology. Technology should be able to solve that. We should make that right uh, something that all of us can enjoy. About $2 billion is sent from the United States to Cuba in remittances every year. That's about 3% of the Cuban GDP. We believe that we can introduce our global remittance service, Zoom, uh, to Cuba by year end, making it hopefully easier for Cuban Americans and other American citizens to send money to their loved ones here in Cuba to send money to entrepreneurs who are trying to start businesses here to fuel their dreams and their ambitions. And of course, there are so many other services that PayPal can offer. Obviously, when we talk to entrepreneurs today, they're all eager to access the internet, access to uh, uh, other markets in the world, 
and 25% of PayPal's revenues are cross-border trade. And so we look forward to working with Cuban business leaders, Cuban entrepreneurs, to bring a connectivity to users across the world uh, to expand uh, their opportunities and again, to further the commercial ties between our two countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Carlos. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. And I want to thank the administration for having me on this, uh, in this panel here. Uh, just as background for those who may not know, uh, I was born in Cuba. And I left at uh, six years of age, 1960. I have been a lifelong student and observer of Cuba. And I should say also, I've been a lifelong Republican. Um, but I also want to say that I am convinced that this is the right policy at the right time. Cuba's changing, and we see that we have more mutual interest than ever before. Uh, it is breathtaking to see how much it has changed. Uh, private cooperatives, entrepreneurs, uh, whether it's barber shops, whether it's people buying or selling their homes, um, people forming their own software development businesses, accounting services businesses. Cuba is changing. And um, I'm very proud to say that we're changing with it and we are actually contributing uh, as much as we can within the reins of the sanctions, we are contributing as much as we can. Um, and I credit President Obama for that, for his executive actions um, that have enabled this. Um, I, I want to say one thing about uh, a subject that always comes up, and I'd like to preempt it, um, the subject of human rights. Um, I see this mission and this visit, this presidential visit, as a great uh, journey of human rights. The, the right to make a living is one of our most precious of rights. We value that very, very much in the U.S., and that's what's happening today in Cuba. Cubans are being enabled to start their own business and to develop their own future, their own vision for their life. Uh, and we are contributing to that. And that's why I'm so convinced that we are on the right track as a country uh, and as an administration. Also watching US companies come in in hospitality, in agriculture, in infrastructure, that is also tremendous change. And then lots, let's not forget, that's happened in about 15 months from the announcement. So things are moving quite rapidly, uh, and it's great to be part of it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Carlos. So uh, why don't we open it up now to questions uh, for these gentlemen, and uh, who wants to start? Uh, let's see, Jim. Uh, Josh, uh, earlier today we asked President uh, Castro about uh, political prisoners here in Cuba, and he said if you could provide me with a list, we could have those prisoners released. Does the administration have a current list of known political prisoners in Cuba? I know that might be a, a difficult proposition, uh, but I, I wanted to follow up with that question. Well, before we before we do that, I think what I'd like to do is to take the questions that are directed to these gentlemen. Uh, and then we can take the, the broader questions. You certainly asked a legitimate one, and we will come back to it. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. I'm Peter Carver, The Nation Magazine. What is the strategy from the business leaders, uh, we have three right here, to go back to Washington and, and bring the experience of this trip I mean, and the various degrees of lobbying on, on the Republican leadership of the House and Senate? Well, I guess it's a Republican, I should answer. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there, is a, uh, there is a delegation here. There are Republicans and Democrats. And uh, there are a lot of business uh, people who have been here uh, who are actively engaged in ensuring that either all of the sanctions are lifted or part of the sanctions are lifted. As you know, it has to go to a vote. It's part of the law. So uh, the business community is very active. And what I find is that they get even more active after having come to Cuba. So my first recommendations of the business communities come to Cuba. And I'm sure when they go back, they will get a lot more engaged than they are today. Is that at all? I think as every company, obviously, we have to follow the rules and regulations of the various jurisdictions that we operate in. But I think Carlos is exactly right. 
Um, coming down here, what you realize and what you realize as you travel all over the world as a business leader is every one of us basically are the same at heart. We have the same dreams, we have the same hopes and aspirations. And coming down here just reinforces that. We did have a chance for a couple of hours to meet with the counterparts, with entrepreneurs, with business leaders. And they were very candid in their hopes and their dreams. And I think as business leaders, what we can do is express uh, to the government, uh, both here in Cuba uh, and in the US, our desire to further those commercial relations because it matters and it makes a difference and we want to do that. John. Thank you. This is uh, excuse me, a question for the gentleman from Airbnb. I was hoping that you could just give uh, an idea about the way your business model works here in Cuba. Uh, what percentage of your gross revenues goes to the Cuban government? Is it more than what you typically would um, receive if you were in the United States and dealing with a local municipality? And have you partnered with any particular Cuban entity here in terms of trying to do business in Cuba? Yeah. Um, the way the model works is that um, all of our hosts have licenses here in the government. Um, they are taxed essentially a sales tax of 10%. And so since they're licensed, they have records that go to the government. At the end of the year, they have to de declare income tax. And I believe um, it's 35 uh, pesos or 35, $35 a month. So that's a tax. It's probably fairly similar, actually, to the United States, where we're collecting remitting hotel occupancy tax. Um, this has actually already been going on for a generation, frankly, in Havana. Um, since the early 1990s, there's, we estimate at least 20,000, maybe more homes that are um, shared uh, by Cuban locals. And you know, 4,000 are on Airbnb. But the partnership was fairly seamless. And um, the biggest challenge, I think, was internet connectivity. The way we're able to solve that is there are some people that are connected to the internet, and they are um, hosting partners who connect locally to the hosts that actually have their homes. And uh, so that's essentially how we're able to do business here. For you, are you actually making profit by doing business in Cuba? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a extremely. Um, I mean, Cuba is the fastest growing market ever for Airbnb, and you know, as a marketplace, it works as efficiently, frankly, as any other market. Victoria, I'd like to hear from the business leaders about what are their concerns about a Republican coming in as president in the U.S and possibly rolling back any reforms that President Obama has made? And what are they hearing from the Cuban entrepreneurs about that? I, I believe that, uh, especially after a visit like this, a presidential visit, that everything that's done will make it more difficult to reverse this. Every time a U.S. company comes in uh, and signs a, uh, a, an agreement, signs a deal, uh, every time you get more travelers coming in, not as tourists, but travelers coming in uh, and going back home and talking about their experience, I just think there comes a point where reversing it will seem like a very crazy idea. And I think we're, we're just about at that stage. And after a presidential visit and people looking at Cuba and getting a glimpse of our neighbor, um, I, I think it's just going to make it more and more irreversible. That's my, uh, that, that's my sense of, of state of affairs today. You want to what are you hearing from that? Uh, well, the, the, every, you know, the Cubans, uh, one of the things we hear a lot around town is, uh, gosh, you know, we hope, but let's see. And, and they know they're very in tune with our politics and very in tune with the fact that there will be a change of presidency and, uh, and elections coming up and what that will mean for them. Um, and, and, of course, what's in everybody's mind is, you know, what we call the embargo. They call the blockade. I, I like to think of them as sanctions because there are all these complex sanctions. But just think about this one. This is the only country in the world where a U.S. citizen cannot travel as a tourist the only country in the world. So it's time to step back and just think about what we're doing, whether this, is, uh, whether this makes any sense or not. And uh, from my point of view, it makes very, very little sense. 
Alicia. Um, thank you. We're right up against a deadline, so please excuse me for asking a question directed to you and Ben. Okay. Um, but this afternoon, the president reportedly said he would be happy to meet Fidel Castro to close the Cold War. Um, could you give us any more specifics uh, that he gave in making those comments or that you can shed light on uh, about when and where and how a visit like that could take place? And do you still rule out a private visit between the two men happening on this visit? Yeah, look, I think the President was speaking uh, generally um, about the uh, potential for some uh, engagement in the future. But the fact is, um, on this trip, um, we are not uh, planning to meet with Fidel Castro. Um, we have not requested such a meeting. Uh, the President's counterpart is, is Raul Castro, and that's who we obviously met with today. The Cubans have not requested such a meeting of us. Um, so uh, th uh, that meeting is not a part of, uh, of this trip. I think he was speaking about the fact that um, there are a variety of ways in which uh, we're closing the circle uh, on our history. Um, I think you know he obviously noted um, the, uh, the health issues uh, that Fidel Castro has had. Um, but the fact of the matter is, on this visit, um, neither we nor the Cubans have even uh, suggested that such a meeting take place. We just do a couple more for the business leaders, and then yes, sir. Uh, were you always a, uh, a believer or are you a recent convert to normalizing relations with Cuba? And also to uh, Daniel Shulman, um, given some of the uh, challenges um, with internet connectivity and access to their um, to devices, uh, are you thinking about making accessible sort of mobile money, for example, uh, such as you may have heard of M-Pesa, I'm, I'm guessing? I, I was not always a believer in this policy. Um, I didn't have one moment of, a, you know, a lightning bolt hitting me and I changed from one moment to the other. It's a lifelong process. As a Cuban exile, you think about this every single day. Um, and when the president made the announcement uh, sometime after that, realizing that for once, uh, more so than over the last 58 years, our interests are aligned, U.S. and Cuban interests. Um, so I believe the time is right, and um, I, am, I, I feel a bit liberated that I can say that because in my gut, it, you know, it gets harder and harder to use talking points. And everybody's got the talking points as to why we should, you know, uh, have an embargo against Cuba. But I think the important thing is to step back and follow your gut and follow your heart and think about whether those talking points are just a little bit stale and a little bit too old. And, and that's what that's the conclusion I reached. I think there's one inevitable fact, uh, and that is that the world is digitizing. And uh, trying to hold that back is like trying to put sand against the waves uh, of the ocean. Um, and as the world digitizes, uh, that brings us closer together, inevitably. I also think it makes things uh, more efficient and allows us to reimagine not what was, but what could be. Um, and I look at examples like M-Pesa, I look at other examples where mobile technology combined with software has redefined the financial services for many consumers. Um, it makes it faster, easier, simpler, more secure, and less expensive. And those are all good things uh, for citizens. And as we think about democratizing financial services, uh, access to the internet, internet connectivity, more and more of the world um, is moving towards smartphones. Uh, there are over two billion of them now throughout the world. Inevitably, that will come to Cuba. Inevitably, the digitization uh, of many industries uh, will occur, and uh, we believe that financial services will be among them, and we intend to be a leader uh, in helping uh, the Cubans when those regulations allow us to do so. We're going to do one last one for the business leaders. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Gutierrez. Um, considering that the media seems to be agree or agree to disagree on what uh, seems right, you know, we have that we have an idea as to what we're discussing. What do you think that uh, the embargo should be lifted 
uh, independently of the fact that Cuba commits first to new uh, liberties, uh, both from a political and human rights view. I believe that the embargo should be lifted today um, on the basis of our mutual interests, on the basis of what's right for U.S. national security. Uh, and again, your, your comment, let's go back to this notion, I mean, human rights is a very broad arena, and we're talking about helping the Cuban people earn the right to make a living, and that is based on the government's uh, changes to the economic model, as they see it, a mixed economy. Uh, so we are helping in human rights, maybe not on all of them, and there are some that we disagree on, uh, but the, the, the progress that has been made, I think, is significant. So uh, somebody mentioned today there are you know, a lot of factors, 50, 60 different factors of what human rights are. We're working on this one very important factor, which is the right to earn a living. There are others that we'll discuss and that we'll constantly, maybe always disagree on, but this isn't the only country in the world where we have some disagreements and we talk about them, but we do trade, we have people-to-people -people engagements, uh, we play sports together. Cuba should be no different. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your being here. Thank you, Dennis. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Go ahead. I'm just going to add one comment to that, which is, um, <coughs> in our view, lifting the embargo, frankly, would be uh, an important step forward uh, in in terms of our promotion of human rights. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, in the past, the United States, for instance, has had to try to distribute phones or certain types of technology uh, to individuals in Cuba. Why not just lift the embargo so that those goods can come here more freely? Uh, lifting the embargo would bring a lot more activity uh, and a lot more material that is empowering to the Cuban people themselves. Um, so restricting the flow of goods into Cuba uh, is not in any way advanced the human rights of the Cuban people. And it may, frankly, in addition to hurting their livelihoods, have denied them access to the types of tools the types of technology uh, that is fundamentally empowering. Um, <clears throat> the second thing I'd say is that for decades, the embargo has been used as a rationale for not extending uh, further rights or loosening restrictions here in Cuba. Um, the government has used it as an excuse or uh, a source of legitimacy uh, in maintaining a certain type of closed system. Um, and so what we are doing, frankly, is uh, eliminating uh, uh, that rationale that the United States is to blame for uh, the circumstances of the Cuban people, uh, and nothing could be more powerful uh, in terms of uh, accelerating that dynamic than lifting the embargo. Great. So, uh, Jim, why don't we go back to your question? And yeah, yeah no, I'm just curious. We asked President Castro about political prisoners, and he uh, basically uh, doubted whether there were any in this country, or, or claimed that there weren't any in this country, and then asked us to provide him with a list. I guess, I guess the question should be, and I didn't ask this fully further uh, a while ago, but um, do you believe, does the administration believe that the government does currently hold political prisoners in Cuba, and is there a list that the administration has? Yeah, look, I, I've um, shared many such lists with the Cuban government uh, over the course of my uh, two and a half years now, I guess, of dealing with them. Um, in the course of the talks leading to normalization, uh, we shared a list of 53 uh, prisoners. Um, who they released uh, around the December 17th announcement. Um, in the run-up to this visit, uh, a number of the cases that we've been addressing with them uh, were resolved in some fashion, uh, whether that was people who'd been released who were not permitted to travel, um, some of them being able to travel, or, or whether there were several uh, cases related to uh, those 53 individuals uh, that were resolved, and some of those people actually chose to come to the United States. Uh, however, there are certainly additional uh, prisoners uh, whose names we raise on a regular basis with the Cuban government. Um, the fact of the matter is, Jim, I think the heart of the, the um, difference with uh, President Castro is not um, their lack of awareness of these individuals uh, and how we follow their cases and how uh, independent organizations follow their cases. Uh, it's their 
um, belief that they are not political prisoners, um, the, that they are in, in, crime, uh, in, in prison for various crimes and offenses against Cuban law. And what we have said, uh, again, in Cuba or in any country around the world, uh, is if someone is detained, imprisoned for a fundamentally nonviolent political offense, like expressing yourself, like demonstrating freedom of assembly, uh, that those people inherently are in prison for political purposes. Um, and it's unjust, therefore, under international principles uh, for those detentions to be carried forward. Um, so we certainly do continue to have uh, individual cases that we raise of people who are in prison here in Cuba for those types of offenses. I think the basic difference is uh, the Cuban government's rejection that uh, they're not in prison for violating their laws uh, and our belief that uh, either their laws or their practices um, uh, again, crack down on certain types of behavior that we believe should be uh, allowed in every country. I would say that the government has shifted uh, in recent years from an approach of long-term detention uh, of individuals to more short-term detentions. Um, and so what you see is this cycle of people uh, protesting and then being detained for a short period of time, then released. Uh, and that cycle continues to play out. So there has been some change in terms of the long-term uh, detained individuals um, and a reduction in that number. Uh, however, there are still people that uh, we uh, follow their cases, we raise their cases with the government, we share lists with the government, um, just as we also raise concerns over the short-term detention practices. And, and if I may follow up, since you seem to issue this demand, uh, do you feel any need to say, well, here's another list? Uh, did, no. did anybody have yeah. that conversation following the press conference, or did you see that sort of bluster? Or no, I, look, we 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 th there is very rarely an engagement in which we're not raising um, either lists or individual cases. That will certainly be the case going forward. Um, and again, I think the the disagreement and difference that uh, that conversation uh, you know, raises uh, is simply their rejection of the notion that those people are political prisoners. Olivia. Thanks, guys. A couple questions. One is, um, any movement on getting uh, American companies to be able to hire directly without going through the, uh, the Cuban government? And the other is, um, in December, the president said he would not come to Cuba if he didn't see progress. So he didn't really specify what kind of progress, but progress on economic and political fronts. What did he see between December and now that encouraged him to come on this visit? I think he said that in a penetrating interview with Yahoo, I believe. Yeah. Is that right? Um, <laughs> So um, uh, on your second question, um, you know, where we see progress and where we see change in Cuba um, is in a number of the areas we discussed today. Uh, so for instance, we've seen this steady growth in the self-employed sector, uh, which we believe is both an economic and a human rights issue, frankly, because when people are self-employed, when people control their own livelihoods, they are fundamentally uh, empowered in a way that they would not be uh, if they uh, we're reliant on the state. Uh, that sector is growing very fast in the Cuban economy. Uh, it is benefiting significantly from our policy changes, from the remittances that are flowing down to Cuba, from the engagement that they're having uh, with Americans and American businesses. We see that as a positive trend line that we wanted to reinforce, and that's frankly why you had the president go to a Paladar last night, uh, meet with uh, Quinta Propista today, uh, we want to be accelerating this process because we think it's good for Cuba's economy and good for the rights uh, and livelihoods of the Cuban people. Um, we see, uh, you know, these incremental steps that we would like to be faster uh, on issues related to access to the internet uh, and connectivity uh, in Cuba. Uh, and we want to be finding whatever way we can uh, to support that, you know, whether that's the U.S. government uh, raising those issues whether that's a company like Cisco today announcing that they're going to have an IT academy uh, here in Cuba, whether that's our telecommunications companies uh, reaching agreements uh, to provide services here in Cuba, which is why, you know, your, your phones and Blackberries may work today, whereas they wouldn't have a couple years ago. Um, so there's some progress in these spaces that are on the overlap of uh, economic, uh, you know, economic empowerment, um, but also, frankly, individual empowerment that comes through uh, access to resources, access to information. Um, where there's been less progress, uh, and we've seen kind of the sustained pattern of behavior from the government, is on issues related to political speech, uh, political assembly, uh, detention of activists. Uh, and that's been you know, a common uh, thread before, during, and after normalization. Our belief is 
that having direct dialogue with the government about this, uh, being more deeply engaged here in Cuba, uh, in the long run, ultimately, uh, is going to open up more space uh, for the Cuban people. Uh, and you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, it is not as if the you know human rights situation was benefiting from the previous policy of being closed off and having the embargo and having uh, a very restrictive uh, uh, approach to Cuba. Uh, in fact, the Cuban government was very comfortable in that position. Uh, they were not um, in any way making changes to address it. We believe that coming here is part of an effort uh, to continue to uh, promote an opening that in the long run is going to be to the benefit of both the economic uh, circumstances of the Cuban people and their ability to determine their future. Uh, on the first question, really quick. So yeah, we, we, there, look, there's a number of issues we've been raising with them. The step that they took um, that was certainly uh, high on our list uh, was uh, their announcement that they will be removing this penalty on uh, dollar conversions, uh, which is important. Uh, it allows American travelers uh, uh, and other travelers, frankly, to be able to utilize the dollar and not pay essentially a tax. Frankly, that's going to allow them to spend more money here, which is a part of our policy. We want that to reach the Cuban people. Um, at the same time, it's going to make it easier for our businesses to operate so they don't have to switch to euros or other currencies. Um, that was a positive step. Direct hiring is an issue that we uh, raised with them. Um, the, I'd say the two biggest long-term issues we raised with them are the unification of their currency uh, and the direct hiring issue. Uh, on the direct hiring issue, well, frankly, on both of those issues, um, you know, what they have indicated to us is they have every intention in, uh, in moving in that direction, um, but you know, they are not yet there yet. Um, and part of what we're trying to do is accelerate those processes by having this dialogue, by frankly having our business community engage them to explain why these would be positive changes uh, for their economy, uh, for having you know, uh, other uh, governments who share our concerns raise these similar issues. So uh, I think on those more structural reforms, um, it's not as if they reject uh, the notion it is that they are moving uh, on a slower timeline than, frankly, you know, we would uh, recommend. Uh, but that's one reason why we're going to keep uh, keep at it on those issues. Josh, um, I wanted to get the backstory on this extraordinary news conference that we had today. Uh, how hard did the White House have to push for that to happen? Um, were there any uh, conditions that the Cubans asked for or received um, to do that? Uh, when did you guys? find out that it would be able to happen? And uh, did you get any sense afterwards of how the Cubans felt about how it went? Yeah, so we, we raised this issue throughout the trip planning. Um, the Cubans you know, indicated that that's certainly not their normal practice. Um, and you know, essentially, the points that we were making up until today were that you know, everywhere the president goes, he takes questions uh, from his traveling press. That's just a part of what we do, and we think it's important um, that, uh, frankly, the spirit of normalization and the opening between our countries uh, suggests that uh, you know, we should be able to stand before our assembled press um, and take questions. Um, and again, as the President said today, that's part of having this debate and this dialogue. Um, we're not afraid of uh, you know, having criticism directed at us or having tough questions directed at us, and we think that that should be the approach of the Cuban government. Um, uh, it didn't really get finalized until today. Um, uh, when uh, President Obama saw President Castro and he indicated, yes, he'd be uh, happy to take those questions. They certainly knew of our interests, but uh, we didn't finalize the format for that um, uh, press conference until uh, really, you know, right as the meeting was uh, commencing. I think he wanted to uh, speak to President Obama and, and tell him directly that he would uh, take those questions. Um, uh, again, I'd say it's very important. Um, it's certainly not normal for you know, the, uh, the Cuban president to be asked questions like that um, here in Cuba or anywhere else, um, uh, to have to engage in that um, back and forth. Uh, and we believe that's healthy, because um, it's all part of bringing these issues out into the open um, and subjecting them to scrutiny. Um, and there's no greater scrutiny that uh, you can get than uh, answering questions from, from you guys. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I, I have not talked to the Cubans um, about their reaction, but again, I think it was the right thing to do. Um, I think it's you know, good that President Castro, in addition to answering the question from the Cuban press, uh, answered uh, the questions from the U.S. press. Uh, I think it was uh, illuminating um, uh, that it took place, um, and it highlighted essentially the, the differences we have in our political systems and our approaches to, to a whole range of issues. Carol. Can I follow on that? Can you give us some of the President's reaction to that <coughs> extraordinary news conference? and? 
what was your understanding of what did you guys tell Castro that the format was going to be? Because he seemed very confused that Andrea and Jim asked him questions. Was he? Did he think his one question versus the president's two questions was only going to come from his side? And then I have a Google question too. So um, no, the format was that we would take. Uh, a question from a U.S. journalist, a Cuban journalist, and a U.S. journalist. Um, that was what we fully anticipated. Um, uh, you know, it, it may be that, uh, um, you know, g given how uh, infrequently uh, those types of engagements happen uh, in Cuba, that uh, the, the notion that you all would ask questions of both leaders, um, you know, certainly was not the normal practice, but he knew and we were very transparent in saying uh, our journalists tend to ask questions of both leaders and, and sometimes they even ask more than one question. <laughs> um, so we, 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 we explained that. I mean, we were transparent about that. Um, uh, again, I think it's just, it's an unusual occurrence. Um, and, um, but again, I, you know, it's, um, uh, he did answer the questions. Um, uh, it, was, it wasn't quite as uh, unusual as uh, when Xi Jinping didn't answer Mark Landler's question until after he had answered the state-run question. I mean, so it, it, it lent itself to a, a good back and forth, and that's a great thing. Um, and look, that's part of opening up space. That would not have happened without this policy. You know, without a policy of normalization, without an engagement with the Cuban government, you wouldn't have the U.S. president standing next to the Cuban president answering questions from assembled press. Um, that alone, I think, indicates that we're in a new era, uh, and one that is a healthier way of dealing with these differences uh, than simply being in, in our own corners. Response. What were his thoughts? No, he look. He thought it was interesting. Um, he uh, um, no. I, I mean, I thought you know he thought it was you know a, you know a truly remarkable uh, occurrence and uh, a, again a positive step that uh, you just had the fact of um, the two of them standing there uh, taking questions. Um, so we really, you know, a, a lot of what we're doing is is new. Um, I mean, this whole policy. It feels like everything that we do, we're doing for the first time, <laughs> or the first time in 57 years. And so uh, that he has commented on, that, like many of these things, including that, um, everything that you we're doing feels like we're, we're doing something for the first time. Can you explain what the President was referring to when he told ABC that he was, had an pending announcement on Google? What is your, what's your guys' expectation of that? Yeah, so um, Google uh, has been in discussions with the Cuban government about uh, a range of different ways that they could contribute uh, to uh, connectivity um, in Cuba uh, and contribute uh, to, you know, enhanced connectivity uh, for the Cuban people. Um, and they've made progress in those discussions. It didn't, it's not complete today, but uh, that's something that Google's uh, continuing to pursue. And it's something, you know, we very much support. We've supported um, all of our companies in, uh, in these engagements. Um, we think it's particularly uh, important that you have uh, tech and telecommunications companies uh, pursuing these agreements. The Cisco IT Academy today, uh, again, will build capacity here, will uh, provide an opening for Cisco uh, to be operating here. Again, the telecommunications companies uh, operating here is important. Hopefully that is the beginning of something that continues to grow um, so that uh, whether it's Google or Cisco or AT&T or Sprint or Verizon, that uh, their kind of first entry into uh, Cuba is the beginning of a relationship that evolves as Cuba uh, gets more online. So again, as the President said, um, as with other, other companies, we think it's very good that Google is um, uh, pursuing a range of uh, initiatives with the Cuban government, and you know, we would certainly support them as well as any other uh, U.S. company uh, that, you know, consistent with our existing laws and regulations, uh, wants to do business here. Right here in the front. LA Times. Okay. Did the president discuss Guantanamo, and did President Castro? What were sort of the? Did he discuss the U.S.'s human rights record, and what was President Obama's response? So, um, uh, yeah, the Cuban government certainly raised Guantanamo. Um, um, it's normal for them to raise Guantanamo, and and just about every engagement we have with them, they obviously believe that our our presence for put aside the prison for a moment uh, just our very presence in Guantanamo um, is a violation of their sovereignty and that we should restore uh, the facility to Cuban sovereignty um, we've made very clear uh, that you know that's not on the table frankly our focus right now is on closing the prison um, so essentially it's an area of difference um, 
uh, and I'm sure they're going to you know continue to raise it. Um, uh, with respect to you know human rights, um, again, I mean I think you know what what um, President Castro said you know publicly is a pretty good reflection of of his views. Um, you know, in, in the past, uh, you know, he's been critical of uh, everything from the fact that we uh, you know have Guantanamo um, to uh, uh, practices the U.S. is engaged in overseas violations in his view of sovereignty of other countries, um, uh, you know, a whole host of issues related to the nature of uh, America's economy and inequality. And, uh, you know, so those are, I think, standard uh, points that we hear from uh, the Cuban government on. Um, you know, so that's kind of part of the discussion, uh, but, you know, it wasn't necessarily a debate about um, those issues today, uh, but you know, I think you know Guantanamo they would put in the category of something that is a, a violation of their uh, sovereignty. And in the past, frankly, you know they've um, uh, they've criticized publicly and directly to us privately um, the you know detention practices at Guantanamo. So it's a it, to them it's a double uh, a double issue that they raise. But uh, again, as the President said, we're not afraid to have that debate. You know we. Um, you know, we think it's it's well it's healthy for countries to surface their views on these things. We think the Cuban government should take that same approach uh, that they should welcome a debate here in Cuba and globally about human rights, um, uh, because ultimately there are different views here in Cuba about that. And the administration's point of view is close the, the prison, but keep the land. Yeah, that's uh, that's our you know that's our policy. Um, um, well, right now. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the fundamental truth is that the fo overwhelming focus has been on um, closing the prison. Uh, I think, generally speaking, in the past, Guantanamo has served a purpose uh, in certain, uh, you know, on certain humanitarian responses, certain migration responses. Um, and so that would be, I think, uh, the view of what uh, the facility would be used for. But, you know, frankly, that would be a determination um, that the Pentagon would have to make about what they would be doing with the facility if the pr 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 prison is closed. Mark. Uh, thanks. Um, I wonder if you could take us ahead to tomorrow a little bit. Um, it's hard to imagine that the President could say anything he didn't already say today, but can you talk to us about um, what he'll say in that speech about uh, what he hopes to do with that dissident meeting, and um, are you expecting either the release of more folks tomorrow or at least a promise not to you know, arrest anyone uh, tomorrow off of that meeting? Um, and um, I guess that's it. Yeah. I mean, I want something on the agenda, but everyone else has questions too. So. Well, the, the speech is very important because it's the, the one chance on this visit to really step back and just speak directly to the Cuban people and all of the Cuban people. Uh, you know, I mean, we've engaged thus far the government. We've engaged uh, entrepreneurs. We engaged you know, the faith community yesterday, the Catholic Church. Um, but tomorrow, uh, you know, the president uh, sees that as an opportunity to speak to all Cubans. Um, and you know, the fact that that will be a, a able to be broadcast uh, and received here in Cuba uh, provides an important opportunity for him to lay out his vision for what the future is. Um, and I think you know, what he'll do is pull together all of these different uh, themes that he's been discussing um, about the history between our countries, about why this is the right moment uh, to be making these changes, uh, but also to say why he believes that we should be hopeful for the future uh, here in Cuba. Um, what we can do together as countries, but also uh, how we address difficult issues, um, whether it's uh, Cuba's ongoing efforts uh, to reform its economy, whether it's our uh, respective views of human rights and, and how we see that uh, connecting to the future that the Cuban people um, are, are able to build here, uh, whether that's the future role of Cuba in the Americas and their uh, work with us on a variety of issues. Um, so I think he'll want to step back uh, and lay out the vision for where this is going. Uh, and there's been all this activity and all this debate and all this churn in different areas. Uh, tomorrow I think he wants to pull that together, explain why he took the steps that he did on December 17th, explain where this is headed, why he believes it will succeed, why he believes that the Cuban people will have a better future. Um, and the last thing I'd say is that we see it as a speech to the Cuban people. That includes Cubans in the United States. Um, this visit is a very powerful uh, moment uh, for uh, the Cuban American community. Uh, some of them uh, are very excited, some of them are ambivalent, some of them are opposed. Um, and given the very complicated history, the President believes that one of the most important things that we can be doing 
uh, is building bridges and reconnecting and, and facilitating the reconciliation of the Cuban American community with Cubans here on the island. Uh, that's important uh, from a, a, you know, a human perspective, from a reconciliation of a family's perspective. It's frankly also important to Cuba's future because there's a great resource in the Cuban American community. Uh, already a significant amount of the remittances that are supporting small businesses here come from that community. So he'll speak uh, uh, to that audience as well. On the civil society meeting, I think he'll want to hear directly uh, from uh, the participants about what their experiences are. Uh, Cuba is not a monolith. Um, the government itself is not a monolith, and certainly the government and civil society uh, have differences. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's really mainly an opportunity for him to hear from people who are um, active in different ways um, in advocating for more rights, advocating for more opportunity, um, about uh, what their life is like uh, and what they uh, seek for the future. Um, in terms of detentions, uh, again, I think th that's an ongoing um, topic of discussion between us. Um, a number of the people who are participating in the meeting tomorrow are people whose cases over the years we followed very closely uh, and have raised with the Cuban government. Um, and my, you know, my expectation is that will continue to be the case going forward. Yes, the gentleman in the back. Uh, Crystal Creek with uh, Pause Communications. The political prisoners on the other side of the coin, what about American citizens who are wanted in the United States for crimes they committed who are being given sanctuary by the Cuban government? Yeah, so the issue of fugitives um, is also uh, a, a feature of our discussions with the Cuban government. Um, we have a range of people who, uh, whose extradition we're very interested in here in Cuba. Uh, frankly, they have a number of people in the United States uh, whose cases they ra ra raise with us. We were unable to essentially have a channel of communication on those issues for many years. And what we've been doing since normalization is we've established a law enforcement dialogue so our relevant ministries uh, can raise those cases uh, directly as well as other issues um, and pursue a resolution. Uh, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, it's, it's been difficult um, in both directions uh, thus far uh, to make progress uh, on the issue of fugitives. But if we establish a basis of uh, dialogue, exchange of information on these issues, uh, our hope and expectation is we can make more progress going forward, um, either with individuals who are already here or individuals who may come here. Um, uh, in, in the future. So uh, there, too, we believe um, that better to be able to raise these issues directly through law enforcement channels uh, than to deny ourselves that capacity. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, hi. Nora Gams from Nuevo Herald. Uh, ben, what's your reading of the arrest that happened on Sunday, just the very same day the president was coming? Would you expect that to happen at all? The, sorry, the, the arrest, you mean? Yeah. yeah, those ones activists on Sunday. Well, yeah, look, this is, um, this is exactly what um, our, you know, one of our principal uh, differences is with the Cuban government, which is that there is a pattern of these short-term detentions or harassment uh, of individuals who are seeking to express what we believe are universal human rights. Um, you should have the ability to protest peacefully. You should have the ability uh, to speak your mind, even if it's critical of the government. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's all too common um, that we see this cycle of arrest. Um, it, that's certainly been the case with the ladies in white in particular. Um, and it's been a focus of ours. That's one of the reasons why uh, the president wrote a letter to the ladies in white, just to make clear to them that this is something he'd be raising with uh, President Castro and he'd be talking about while he was here. Um, th we, those are the types of practices we'd like to see changed. Um, every time we see a detention uh, of, of, of individuals for expressing those rights, and there have been detentions of uh, ladies and white activists, you know, uh, uh, before and during this visit, and, uh, um, you know, we will watch very carefully uh, uh, whether they continue in the future, uh, we immediately raise the, those cases with the, uh, the government. But the, we believe that um, it's important for us to be able to uh, engage that community directly ourselves so that we're talking to them and hearing from them and understanding what their views are and what their plans are, just as we are able to raise those cases with the government. And you know, part of what's happening in Cuba here is as you know, this is a focus of attention, as normalization proceeds, as there's greater people traveling here, greater media attention on the island, you see people uh, looking to express themselves. Um, and that, that's healthy. That's what opening up to the world is about, uh, is people being able to see the diversity uh, of views uh, among the Cuban people. Uh, and so that's 
uh, something that you know uh, is going to continue to be front and center in our policy in terms of trying to open up that space between Cuba and the world and, and trying to support the rights of uh, individual Cubans to be heard. Was that something that you were expecting that could happen? Like, oh, yeah, well, look, I mean, uh, uh, unfortunately, yes, um, you know, because uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, the sad truth is that this has been a pattern for uh, a long time now, where um, you know the the ladies in white protest on Sunday, um, and then you have the protest broken up. You have a number of individuals detained, um, and uh, again, you know, we certainly would like to see that cycle broken. Um, we certainly would like to see anybody, uh, not just the ladies in white, anybody, be able to express themselves peacefully here in Cuba as anywhere else in the world. Um, and so this is a constant element of our dialogue with the Cuban government. It's why we think it's important to have a human rights dialogue here in Cuba, uh, so that you know, we're making clear that this is part of our relationship. You know, it's not just that we're going to talk about the things that we agree on or the things that maybe we have differences, but we're working through them on the economy. Uh, no, a feature of our relationship is going to be also uh, having a platform to discuss the things that we uh, care about, including the things that we disagree with. I think we have time for two more, unfortunately. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it was for a political magazine. I wanted to ask about uh, the issue with Guantanamo. Uh, did the Cubans, I'm just qu curious uh, uh, how much Guantanamo, one, came up, but two, did the Cubans bring up the, the idea that I was told that the, their lease with the United States, that the United States is in violation of their lease because there's no provision for putting a prison on the U.S. lease. That's question one. And the second question is, is there a concern by the administration that, you know, sort of the, uh, the China model that Raul Castro likes and that we're sort of pursuing here, where you have great economic exchanges, uh, whether that might not trickle down into human rights as sort of the situation with China being an economic power but not having uh, much freedom uh, for dissent? So uh, first, um, you know, their objection to Guantanamo goes beyond the, the specific issue of the prison. So that wasn't the focus. It was more just simply uh, the fact that this land should be restored to them, that uh, it's illegitimate in the first instance, um, and that, you know, they want this. In their view, normalization isn't complete until Guantanamo is returned, and that's the main point that they make. Um, uh, this, on your second question, look, the, you know, we've been very clear that Cubans will decide the future of Cuba, that we're not going to impose uh, a political system or an institute regime change in Cuba. On, on the specific question, what I would just say is that there's enormous differences between China and Cuba or even Vietnam and Cuba in the sense that, number one, you have this tremendous uh, kind of cultural affinity um, between the American Cuban people. Um, you have an enormous uh, Cuban-American community that is deeply invested uh, in the future of Cuba. Uh, and you also just have the basic proximity of Cuba being 90 miles from the United States. Um, so you know, that doesn't determine exactly how Cuba's evolution is going to go, but it certainly suggests that um, an opening between the United States and Cuba uh, is going to look very different from uh, the United States and China, a country uh, uh, you know, of a billion people on the other side of the world, uh, or even Vietnam, similarly, uh, at a great uh, geographic and cultural distance from us. Um, you know, opening up this space uh, with a country that shares so much with us, that has so much uh, common family bonds, uh, common history, uh, coupled with the fact that, uh, again, this is uh, our closest neighbor um, uh, other than those that border uh, the United States, I think suggests that uh, that opening is more likely to uh, play out differently than China and Vietnam. John, no pressure. John, give you the last one. Both presidents made allusions to not having discussed Venezuela today, that it came up. And this was something that was somehow kind of left unreconciled and in the air. And in light of the fact that President Maduro made a kind of lightning trip here, um, just similar in, in a way is what he did before the uh, America's summit in April in Panama. Um, I just wondered if you could expand a little bit on that. And, and, and one final follow-up question on the whole issue of U.S. businesses. I just wonder if in any of these conversations, uh, President Castro or some of the other Cubans <coughs> have ever uh, made it clear which companies they definitely do not want here. Have they, is there, 
certain companies or certain types of companies that they have said they do not want here. So uh, that's interesting. Not No, they haven't, at least not in the conversations I'm familiar with. I do think uh, that they are uh, being somewhat cautious about this scale of the opening. Um, so it's less about companies in uh, certain sectors and more about uh, I think they'd be wary to sign 100 deals tomorrow, uh, and suddenly you've got the U.S. business community, uh, you know, in, in an enormous role in their economy. So I think what they're part of what they're trying to do is figure out how to um, uh, view the pace of the opening to U.S. businesses, and also how does that coincide with the pace of their own economic reforms? Um, and so they're trying to calibrate. Um, where does the opening come in terms of U.S. business and where does uh, the pace come from in terms of their changes? Um, we've been very uh, mindful to try to have multiple sectors. So it's not just hospitality. Um, you know, it's good that Starwood is going to be uh, co-managing hotels. Uh, frankly, that's a commercial opening. It also means more travelers. That also means more people eating in Quinta Propisto and restaurants or shopping in Quinta Propisto and stores. So it's both going to benefit that state-run sector of hotels, but also benefit the Cuban people directly. Uh, that's the same reason why it's good that the cruise lines uh, have reached agreements and you're going to have more Americans be able to come down here. Um, at the same time, though, we think it's important that you also have tech companies, as I said, or uh, agricultural companies like Caterpillar beginning to see what they can do here, or GE is, is talking about what they can do here. We want to see that diversity, and frankly, the Cubans have welcomed it. I guess I would say, suggest that the Cubans are probably going to be cautious about um, tech and telecom in terms of essentially having American tech companies completely wire the island. Um, uh, they w would, I think, want to have a diversity uh, of uh, foreign investors uh, and developers with respect to their uh, internet access and, and telecommunications infrastructure. And look, that, that, that makes sense. We obviously always prefer U.S. businesses, but uh, we also want them to get connected in any way they can. Uh, we happen to believe U.S. businesses are best for that. Um, on your first question, um, uh, Venezuela you know, didn't come up in the meeting. It's been a regular feature in our discussions. Um, you know, what's interesting is uh, the point we would make to the Cubans is that our interest is in stability in Venezuela, right? Nobody in the region benefits from an economic collapse or catastrophe in Venezuela. That could have knock-on effects for many countries and certainly have knock-on effects for Cuba. So there's actually a basis for the United States and Cuba and Brazil and Argentina and Colombia and others to agree on the need for there to be a political circumstance in Venezuela that brings stability. Our view is the way for that to take place is for there to be uh, a more coherent dialogue between the opposition that just won uh, the parliamentary elections and the Maduro administration. That, in fact, just trying to uh, back Maduro 100% uh, without creating the space for this opposition to uh, essentially work to determine what the economic program is in partnership with the government uh, is a potential recipe for instability. Um, and so that we're trying to find essentially that common ground so that we're working together. Uh, we obviously would probably have different views about um, the practices of the Venezuelan government with respect to its people. Um, but the fact of the matter is our, in this case, you know, our interests, you know, in stability and our economic interests coincide with uh, our political interests and just essentially wanting the duly elected parliament to have uh, an effective dialogue and ability to work with the administration. Um, I'll just close on one point because uh, you gave the opening which is, you know, this Cuba policy is also a Latin America policy. Um, this was the main anchor on our standing in Latin America for decades. Um, the normalization with Cuba in many ways is also a normalization uh, within the Americas. Uh, and we've had uh, enormously positive reception from every country in the Americas to this. It's changed the conversation. It's why we're at the peace table with the Colombians here in Havana. Um, we're going to be able to go on to Argentina, which just elected a, a pro-American leader after many years uh, of having uh, a leader who uh, rejected engagement with the United States. Uh, what we've seen is when we came into office, the United States was uh, essentially uh, in a, an isolated position, and many of our critics in the hemisphere uh, were uh, ascendant at that point. Uh, frankly, because of what we've done for many years, including uh, the normalization with Cuba, the conversation has totally changed in Latin America. So. Uh, it's important to note that we see uh, what we're doing here in Cuba as fundamentally connected to 
uh, again, trying to turn the page in the hemisphere uh, so that we're, we're, you know, we're clearing the air of history, which is uh, very polluted air uh, in different parts of the hemisphere, uh, and working together uh, to solve problems, because there's great opportunity here. So we'll stop there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.